take over the moderator lecture. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for waiting till this moment. Um, I know I'm the one that is keeping me away from the drinks, but I'll try to make it short and uh, condensed. Uh, I won't be presenting my, the full story of my PhD, uh, especially because I was at a theoretical work based on the work of a couple of philosophers, even though I'm in a school of business, but unfortunately I bear no relation with that and not with the topic. So it's largely in political philosophy, and I try to just to present a couple of ideas that will give you a feeling of what I'm, I've been trying to do in my yeah, big manuscript that I'm not going to go reading. Uh, I chose these pictures just to start, then I'll tell you more about my research, because I really like, uh, uh, it's in Italian, but I guess you can have a sense of what it means. So it has two meanings, really, in Italian, in the sense that it would be both resistance continuous or continuous resistance. And um, this was a picture that was taken in a demonstration after the liberation of Italy from the um, Nazi occupation or the, or the liberation from fascism. Uh, and the idea is that it wasn't over. So it, it goes on. And this is exactly what I'm trying to do with my uh, rethinking of uh, the idea of resistance. Um, yeah. So I'll, what I'm going to do today is basically I'm going to start with a short story uh, that I took from a partisan uh, of Italian resistance from, my, from near my hometown and then I'll try to summarize what we normally think of resistance so what when we think of resistance we normally think of uh, an opposition, a struggle, an event, a struggle, a reaction to power and then I'll try to go into the theoretical part, I try to keep, to keep the theoretical part really short uh, and I will use Michel Foucault, a uh, French philosopher, and his idea of uh, resistance that I try to push towards this idea of uh, turning things upside down and bringing resistance as a prior to power. Uh, and as last, I will try to make the connection between resistance uh, and creativity. So I will start with uh, this small story from this area, uh, this is an area, the area where I come from, I actually come, uh, if I can point it, I actually come from, I like to say it, <laughs> from this town, Albano. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about Genzano, which is the town after that, which uh, it sounds very weird to me to speak about those little towns. <laughs> this is like um, a picture, a map, taken from uh, an old newspaper uh, during in 1944, and basically there were the um, allies, Amer the Americans, the British and the French, coming from the south, liberating Italy from the German occupation. The Germans were up above this black line, and this was the, si the line of the struggle, so where the fighting was happening. Now in this picture, as you can see, you find two things. Like basically you find a binary opposition between two sides. One side is the Allies, and the other side is basically the Nazi. Now, what is missing from this picture, though, is the story of those people that were actually in between, <laughs> or were actually in the territory. So it wasn't the official army, obviously, but were people that were organizing themselves into what is being named the, their resistance. Resistance to Nazi fascism, and in Genzano, they were, in this little town, they were quite famous for being really active. It didn't pass through history, so you won't find it really in the history books, but you might find it into the stories that they themselves have tried to tell. Uh, this is one book by this guy, Salvatore Capogrossi, which is the guy with the red jacket. Um, um, and basically, in this, um, in this book, is, is like his biography, and he tells a story that is, to me, a life of resistance. So it's not just like a moment of resistance against a specific enemy, but his resistance like a overall, his whole life. It starts when he was five. I mean, I don't even remember what I was doing when I was five myself. I definitely wasn't part of a socialist youth circle or <laughs> anything like that. <laughs> uh, and it goes on. Like, those are just three examples. But the whole book is about, is about a very strong attitude 
of rebellion, let's say, of change, of transformation. Now, he tells the story at some point uh, in which he try in, in his memories, he tries to make a recollection of what he thought of his experience, and then he discusses a point which is crucial, because it's an official recognition. So at some point, the state, uh, the, Itali the Italian state, after the war was, was over, they had to decide to whom to give the title of Partisan of the Resistance. And obviously with the title it came a little pension as well, so it wasn't just a matter of honor, but also a matter of a little bit of money. And they had to make sort of guidelines to decide who's going to be a resistant and who's not. And, he, and the, they came up to, with this kind of requirement. So you had to, be, to have been participating to at, three, at least three armed conflicts. So you had to use weapons against Nazi at least in three occasions between 1943 and 1945. Now, what he says in the, to this regard, he says, as I was able to show in this book, so about all my life, my actual resistance to fascism, or resistance to fascism in Genzano, actually started in 1919. Now, fascism itself started in 1922, so three years later, but he was already there somehow. And he says, like, I was already ready to be fighting them, <laughs> to push them away. And he's not just saying that. He's saying also that it's not just about shooting, shooting your guns against the Nazi, but there are a lot of other activities that are crucial for the resistance to take place. One thing that he mentions is... Uh, emotional. <laughs> One thing he mentions is the role of, of women during this time. I mean, somebody had to carry weapons from one place to the other. They would never shoot them, but they were crucial to let the other be actually participating to the fight. They were farmers and uh, um, giving shelter to these people, giving food to these people fighting. So resistance actually was going well beyond the conflict. It was starting well beyond, well before the conflict, uh, and even during the conflict, it's not just about the opposition. There were many other activities that took place that were absolutely crucial, and in that sense, it were creative. We'll see this later, but they were creative in. Uh, making sure that an actual resistance or confrontation could actually happen later on. Um, now, the, I define this like as a, a life of resistance, but it's also, I try to break up the war and make it a, a re-existence. So an existence that has a sort of renewal, a new meaning, or a new transformative character that comes with it. Well, I'll, I use this example just to introduce you to the main ideas, or when we think of resistance, uh, not with the capital R, and that's why I put it there from resistances to resistance, but to understand resistance in general. Now, if we think of resistance, we have definitely a, a series of ideas that come to our mind immediately when uh, we think of this word. Uh, first of all, is a circumscribed event. So when we think of resistance, we have a number of images that come to mind and usually have to do with big squares, a lot of people there, uh, some form of opposition of any kind, some form of violence, uh, uh, throwing stones or whatever. But it's an event that has a start and that's an end. As an end. Now, I'm, I don't mean to dismiss those kind of events. I actually really enjoy to be part of those <laughs> events if I ever happen to. And I'm not saying that it's not just that, that it's, I'm against those. What I'm trying to say is that like, the maybe we should appreciate even more than that. So my first question against this kind of accounts of resistance, <coughs> or traditional accounts of resistance, will be if we understand it as an event, can we actually find a date of beginning and a date of end of this event? Or as, uh, as Capo Grossi was saying, mine started much earlier than that. Or as the picture I showed you at the beginning, my resistance will continue even after that the event is over. So this already sheds some light on uh, how we can rethink resistance. Another point, first of all, it's uh, connected to the event. The second point is that it presents itself as a reactive opposition to power. 
So it's always against something. So resistance against what? That would be a, a classic first question. So when you have a resistance, the first thing you will, have, will ask yourself would be resistance against what? And in that sense, you will find million... And again, I really support all those things. <laughs> I will be <laughs> holding those banners myself. But I'm just like trying to understand the theoretical part behind it. So we find, like for instance, in this picture, no borders, no prison, no capitalism, anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-fascist, anti-authoritarian. Now, when we produce this long list, <laughs> my feeling is that we are already getting beyond this oppositional side. So if we are against that, 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 and that, and that, possibly we are already forming a position which is positive, which is constitutive, constituent as well. Uh, and in this sense, we kind of see differently what kind of posture resistance might have. Uh, what are the implications of this traditional account of resistance? It's first of all, is that power is always there. Somehow power remains stable, whatever we want to understand with power. Uh, being there an institution, being there a relation of power, uh, being there a relation of power in, like in this room. But the feeling that we get when we pose resistance as sporadic, as reactive, as oppositional, what we get is that, first of all, resistance takes the name of power. So <coughs> resistance against fascism, we have to include fascism in, in, within the name. So removing any positive aspect of it. Uh, we get the feeling that uh, power is always there, a resistance will be there for a really short time, ready to go away, ready to disappear again, and to vanish. And power is doomed to be there forever. At the same time, power it seems to be neutral. Now, if we look, I try to make a very stupid example, a stupid experiment, uh, and I try to imagine like a, a picture of power. So a picture of power today. And uh, World Economic Forum, a lot of smiling fa smiley faces, and uh, as you can see, already from the name, we find no opposition. So while resistance was fighting against this, this and that, power doesn't seem to fight against anyone. It's got a neutral stance, power is there, is a, there's no opposition involved, and, and so on. At the same time, like committed to improving the state of the world. I really like this, because like, it, instead of admitting that it's all their fault, they say, like, oh, well, actually, like, we are going to change the world as a... Well, they've been on charge forever, but we are, we are committed to change the world. We are committed to transformation, to change. Now, if we apply, this is a little small experiment, I would say, <laughs> if we apply all the things that we attributed to resistance traditionally, we try to understand it from an uh, upside-down perspective and attribute, those attri and attribute those characteristics to power, this picture will, like, will look like something like that. So, World Anti-Equality and Anti-Freedom <laughs> Forum committed against solidarity and human cooperation. I mean, like, if we start rephrasing, <laughs> so we change resistance with something positive and we give the oppositional meaning to power, we actually see through <laughs> this kind of perspective and we see also through how to uh, overcome this moment. Now, Got into the boring part. So, <laughs> how did I get to this point, and uh, what did I use for elaborating those ideas? I my, my work is largely bound to uh, Michel Foucault and to his idea of power relations and resistance. I guess not all of you are familiar with these ideas, but it's basically a view that looks at power. Um, not just in terms of big institutions or big government, states, or whatever, but at the level of um, micro-relationship. So he says, like, even in this room, there would be a set of power relationship. For instance, you are all silent at this moment, so this gives me some form of power over you, in the sense that I can speak, I can prevent you from drinking as well. <laughs> I can go on forever. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so in this sense, even those are a set of uh, power relations. Uh, and uh, it says we can define relationship of power as an action upon action, upon a series of possible action that the other part, whatever you want to call it, uh, has at its disposal. So it, there is a whole field of possible responses and so on. And therefore the exercise of power is a management of possibilities. I included this so 
given that time did my PhD in a school of business, but the fact that there is management here may, may feel, feel a bit more comfortable with the idea. Uh, so what is resistance for Foucault? Foucault uh, did a couple of um, did a series of research on uh, quite strange places that are usually not for philosophers. So he started with mental asylums, then brothels, hospitals and prisons that were the big places where he was looking for his research. And even when he was looking at the prison uh, kind of uh, setting, and even when he was saying that society is like a big prison, he was saying, yes, it seems like uh, all decided, it seems very centralized, but actually we can still hear the rumor of a battle. The battle is still ongoing, the possibility of resistance is there. And then he comes to this interview in which he says really briefly, if there, was no, if there was no resistance, there would be no power relations. So resistance comes first and remains superior to the forces of the process. Power relations are obliged to change with the resistance. This, I think, is the key point, is that power wouldn't change on its own. So, first of all, we understand that power is always contested. And secondly, that power is always obviously conservative. Who's in power wants to stay in power who is in power want to maintain their power position and has no, uh, no will to change. I mean, there is no reason why they should change. If they change, it's just to react to possible resistances or actual resistance that they found. In that sense, instead, resistance is the other, is the other kind of force. It's the force that pushes for transformation, that makes power react, makes power change its attitude. And in this sense, resistance needs to be creative and inventive. Because obviously, we all know how to do things like according to as we've been taught to. But in order to find an innovation, in order to find some creativity, we have to rethink the way in which we've been used to and trying to look at other modalities. In this sense, like my claim is that opposition is not the main uh, character of resistance in itself, because resistance actually will do w rather without opposition. And this brings us closer to another French philosopher of basically the same time, is uh, Gilles Deleuze, and he elaborated this idea of the war machine, like uh, a war machine is something that is opposed to a state machine, but actually, even if it's called the war machine, it doesn't have anything to do with war. Or it does engage in, in war, but he wouldn't like to engage with words. He would like to engage with transformation. We'd like to, uh, to engage with change. So just to summarize and to get to the last slide and a couple of other considerations, my point is that from this uh, elaboration, conceptual elaboration following the work of these philosophers and others that I developed over a series of chapters, the main conclusion is that like, the main point of resistance is not to fight, actually and he would rather not, not to. Now, there, is, there was a banner during, um, during the strike um, that said, and it was a student's banner, and it says, like, rather be in lectures. I really like that one. I, did, I don't believe them. I mean, like, I'd rather be on a picket line, as I was. <laughs> but that is exactly the sense of this uh, in understanding of resistance. You resist because it seems that you have to but you would be much happier not to have that kind of power opposing you and uh, preventing you to reach the certain targets or certain objectives. So in that sense, what's qualified resistance, it shouldn't be that power. In a way, what we think is that the opposition should be understood as something accidental. It is there, but it didn't have to be there. And since it's there, we'll then fight it. But what I'm trying to underline is that we should emphasize a bit more the creative character, the creative and organizational character of resistance, especially in those forms that usually get neglected or get reduced to a big event, or like it was like in the example of Capogrossi that I show you at the beginning. I think it's more than enough. <laughs>